show for you for the rest of the hour. Uh, first, we'll do some why and how of Apache Falcon itself, why it came about and how we did it. And then we'll have an overview of Apache Falcon and what it does, what are the capabilities are. And then we'll go into how we use it at Imobi, a small case study we'll do. And then we'll see what's in store for Apache Falcon as we go forward. We'll take questions. I think you can interrupt any time, morning time, but uh, yeah, we'll be, if you are, you can save it for later. Okay, the story starts. So Imobi was started about six years ago. Uh, I believe since so many of you have heard of Inmobi, uh, you should know that it's in a mobile advertising business. If you've not heard of Inmobi, how many of you have heard of Subway Surfers? Play the game? Yeah, that's better. So why do you think Subway Surfers is free for you? Inmobi makes it free. You display ads there, right? So game application developers need, need to make a living too. So, you know, that's where they get the money and that's how it is free for you. So Inmobi does this mobile advertising business, digital advertising, but very specifically in the mobile domain only. So when we have these ads that we need to serve at such a huge scale, we have about a billion requests for ads used to rather. It's much more than that. And then a million clicks on those ads, right? So how do we handle all that scale? And we need to analyze all of this, every request that is sent. Let's say the subway surfers says I need display, or in mobile display an ad in this space, right? We need to send a corresponding ad there. Every interaction will be logged you know, uh, request, uh, you know, ad server log. And every click will also be logged. So I'm going to go to the part where we do the analytics of these logs. Why do we need to do the analytics of those logs? Three main reasons. One, understand the user, right? So we need to understand what kind of ads are popular in what kind of group of people. What kind of things people between 20 and 30 choose. What kind of ads do people in con uh, for certain country are more responsive to. Or what kind of ads are gender by based, right? Things like that. And also, um, our account managers need to know which ads are performing well, which accounts are performing well. Are we getting are the enough uh, ads being viewed on subway surfers or are enough ads being viewed on a news portal, things like that. So all sorts of analytics keep happening. And to be able to analyze the data and give the right reports, all the billions and billions of data, she'll talk about the scale that we have. But all of that needs to be processed in our uh, Hadoop cluster. So six years ago, uh, when we started, Life was simple. So we used to do this, uh, look at the click logs. Basically, click logs are the ones where when a user clicks on an ad, right, we log it. So we used to look at the click logs and enhance it with some metadata. It could be user data, location data, or it could be what is the corresponding ad, who was the advertiser, who was the publisher, all that metadata, right? We used to enhance it with it and then do an hourly aggregation based on country, advertiser, publisher, all those things. And then do a daily aggregation of it. Um, it's not as simple as this, but it's, this was one of the simplest flows that we had. So all of this used to happen on Hadoop clusters because of the scale of it. And then uh, we had some more requirements like this. Logs, we needed to keep them around for you know two hours maybe. And then uh, we, the processes had different frequencies. One of the processes needed to run for every five minutes. Another. Just 
one independent serial that we are doing. And then of course we had various data replication requirements, retention requirements, archival, and of course we needed lineage also. We needed to find out where this data came. Right? And monitoring, that is the standard requirement. Then we said, okay, let's take a step back. This is not working out for us. Then see what the problem space itself looks like. So if you look at it, this is like your uh, ETL, right? Extract transform tool. We get the data, acquire the data, we do some processing on top of it, we export the data into warehouse for reporting, let's say. And then in between we have uh, eviction, which is basically deletion of data or archive or archival of data. And then we might want to copy the data over also to other platforms. So inside this uh, uh, processing box also we have a chain of things happening. Right? Then we said, okay, so if we look at it this way and let users just focus on their progress processing logic and not worry about anything that is outside that. It'll make their life simpler. And if there's one common platform that gives you all these capabilities, it'll be much easier for people to you know, quickly change their program according to business needs. So that was the primary motivation. Then we said, okay, let's break up the problem areas. And this is how we did. We said there's process management itself. That is a DAG management where you have a graph of process that are tied to each other by streams, right, which are my data. We said we have relays. There's some data that arrives, we need to trigger something, that finishes, something else triggers, so on and so forth, right? So then we have the data, operate to data, right? Do that. Second class of data is data management itself. That's the processing part. And we said there's a management, data management itself, where I need to archive data, copy data, and stuff like that. Then there's data governance, the lineage of the data, where did this data come from? And there's auditing on top of it. And there's also you have to worry about, you know, uh, is my data arriving on time, is my data triggering on time and stuff like that. So once we classified it like this, we said, okay, let's have a platform or a product that addresses each of these areas, and users can just write their pictures or an Appledesia, but we have this. Any questions so far? Okay. So we'll now get into what Falcon actually does for you. What are the different capabilities? So when we built Falcon, we built a simple abstraction over Hadoop, and uh, there's by messaging and all that. So Falcon is the one that the users will interact with to submit their pipeline. So they'll say, here's my pipeline that I need to execute on Hadoop. And there are a bunch of configuration parameters. We'll go into that in the detail later. So they'll use that and uh, schedule it on Falcon. Falcon, in turn, will talk to Hadoop. It will talk to Uzi. It will talk to your Yarn. It will talk to your JMS. Uh, it will talk to your uh, Hedgecat. It will talk to your Hive, whatever else. And kind of abstract it all from you. And it will do the, all the orchestration across all these various components, right? And uh, for you, as far as you are concerned, your interface is very simple. The rest is managed by Falcon. So that is what we came up with. And if you looked at the simple, look at the simple pipeline that I explained before, uh, all these retention, frequency, all of that, users will not have to worry about it. They'll just configure it. I'll show you how they do that. They'll just configure it and then say, OK, I'm done. So. So all the data kind of becomes this where we just configure as Falcon tool and the processing logic goes as Falcon tool as well. So once you define as that, all the cross of the sheet will go away. So all the uh, uh, admin uh, the scripts or tools that you've written to monitor your processing or monitor your data will all go away. And Falcon will simplify that. Okay, so we talked about Hadoop clusters and the process running in the clusters, data being on HDFS. All this has to be in a cluster, right? So all this is happening inside a cluster. So in a Falcon, the terminology we use is called entity. All these are entities. Cluster is an entity. Process is an entity which runs on a cluster. Feed, the data itself, is also an entity that resides on a cluster. So these are the different three kinds of entities that we call out. One is the cluster itself becomes an entity. Then process is an entity. So is feed. And they're related to each other. One process can run on multiple clusters. And the same processing logic, you can have it run on two different clusters. For uh, She'll talk about the business use case we have and why we run the same process on two different clusters. But that could be one thing. Same, similar kind of data can reside on two different clusters. So, so on and so forth, right? So this is how the relationship work, works. Um, a process is related to a cluster. And feed is also related to, uh, is inside a cluster. Process and uh, feed, uh, process consumes from a feed and outputs a feed, of course. 
right? So we talked about a cluster. Now Falcon needs to know what this cluster comprises of. What are the endpoints of this cluster, right? So, so it, you have to tell Falcon how do you access the data residing on the cluster, which is pretty much your HDFS endpoints. Where, and we have one for read and one for write. Some companies do have it like in Inmobi where we redirect all the reads to web HDFS interfaces and writes will be through plain HDFS. And you tell Falcon how to access this data, how to read and write, where to execute it. This is basically your yarn endpoint, right? Saying where does this job really get scheduled? And then you tell where is your registry if you want, where is your edge catalog registry. And then there is a, there are a bunch of uh, Falcon cache where it stores your application logic so it can execute it at runtime when you submit it to Falcon. And there can be some user defined properties that you go ahead. So this is the information that you give to Falcon once or if you have one per cluster. If you have three, four clusters, you will give all this information at once and say, okay, here are the eight different endpoints in Falcon and you're done. So that's your cluster. All right, now um, that is a single cluster mode. Now we also have something called a distributed mode. In distributed mode, we talked about a cluster, right? So if you colo one, colo two, colo three, all these are individual clusters. Then we have something called a prism, where it's like a single federator, right? You submit it to prism, it will make sure it goes and sits in all clusters. So if you want the same process on two clusters, let's say you want it on colo one and two, you say, you give it to prism and say, schedule this on colo one and two. Or you want it on all, you'll say, go schedule this on all. So prism will kind of, you know, do of the federation for you and make sure all your entities go and sit in the right set of clusters. Again, why exactly, what is the business need for uh, Imobi to have this uh, configuration? We'll talk about it. Process management. We, I talked about the three classification of problem areas that we had, right? One was the process management, data management, and data governance. So uh, in process management, we even talked about relays, right? So this is how relay will work. There are a set of actions that you perform and they output a data. That data becomes a trigger for another set of actions and so on and so forth, right? So this data dependency, if you look at something that was already available in the market, for example, Uzi was the thing that came closer, right? Where it does scheduling of your uh, workflow itself. So when we looked at that, it did not understand that there are multiple processes which could be related to each other, right? So Falcon understands this dependency. So for, it looks at things as a pipeline, not as individual, you know, processing units. So it understands the, um, you know, dependencies across these processes and it schedules it and treats it accordingly. So, uh, yeah, for example, the second process is not triggered till the data from the first one arrives and so on and so forth. Um, Right, and also uh, the data that you talk about that it produces could be the data that is generated in the same cluster or it could be data that is generated in another cluster which we'll copy over and then the data in the second cluster gets triggered. So there's cluster one, cluster two, data is produced in cluster one, we wait for it to get copied over to cluster two and we can also trigger it in cluster two. So the dependency drag does not restrict, need not restrict itself to single cluster. It cannot be, it can be cross cluster also. So we have one such requirement where we say, we do some processing in one cluster, send the summary out somewhere else, and there is an aggregation of summaries that happens there. So all these clusters kind of send the summaries to one common location. So that is one requirement where we have, you know, where the processing actually happens on the data that is copied over, right? So that is the process relay. Then we have late data arrival. Um, why is this, why does this become important sometimes? What happens? Uh, let's say, for example, click loss. There is, there is slow processing upstream. I, let's, uh, let's say there's a period of zero to one hour. There's some click logs that arrive for zero to one hour. But for the same time uh, slot, some of the data arrive in the second hour, for whatever reason. It was supposed to arrive in the first hour and the process triggered and consumed it and even processed it. Let's say there were a thousand uh, clicks for a particular ad, right? And it said, okay, thousand clicks per ad. The aggregation is done. We have summarized it. But on the second hour also, we see that the click was for the previous hour is coming in. That is what we call the late data. So for whatever reason it happens, it's a reality, we've seen that it happens. So now what we need to do is we need to be able to handle this also without interfering the downstream uh, uh, you know, uh, processing units because it's a chain, it's the, uh, the chain has been triggered and it, everything's happening. Now you don't want to interrupt it and say, oh, hold on, there's new data coming in. So we do kind of an auto correction later on. We'll say, okay, now the data has arrived. So when you specify saying, okay, look out for late data, 
we continuously keep looking out saying if is there any change in data then we say okay now this needs to be reprocessed and we handle the whole pipeline uh, as part of the reprocessing to make sure the data the new data which arrived late gets processed again so through the whole chain um, and yeah sometimes you might want to say okay I know this data arrived late and somehow I want to treat this differently because I don't want my exi uh, existing pipeline to you know get affected because the data arrived late in which case we'll say okay we'll also let you you know uh, handle this separately if you want to do a separate logic for it there's uh, so this is how you would specify a process in Falcon uh, it's not that cryptic as it looks uh, it's, in fact it's pretty simple so first one first thing you tell is where should the process run simple right we already defined the cluster you've defined a cluster and said these are my endpoints you say okay colo or cluster as we called it we say cluster that you need to schedule it on is this particular cluster and there's validity where you say this process needs to run from this time to this time after that its life is done uh, that is where should you run your process then this is how should you run your process what is the frequency with which you need to run what is the order in this case how many parallel instances can you run what is the order of instances in which you run does the first in first out last in first out or just skip the last one things like that and then of course when there is a process you have to say what it needs to consume from right uh, if you see this uh, there is a start and end so what this and if you look at it there's no time stamp there it is basically very logical it will say this one particularly is saying latest which means now till yesterday zero zero which means 24 hours before from now so whenever the process runs it will pick up the last 24 hours worth of data and process it this is how you specify your data window this is where you say this is the data window on which a particular process is operating on a data window could be five minutes one hour 24 hours for daily job for monthly it will be in a few uh, days so this is where you say this is my data window on which my uh, process will work on of course when you produce it you have to tell it where which of the feed which feed it produces it produces into and where does it reside and yeah your process processing logic pretty much goes here you put a path in here and you say what is the execution engine in here we are saying Uzi it can be pig script it can be a high SQL, high SQL query uh, so you can put whatever you want over there point it to the path in HDFS and we'll trigger it off okay and we talked about this late data processing right so this is what it is if you see here uh, we say when the late input is this click can arrive late and when it arrives late I want a separate workflow to be processed not the current one we also have a policy and delay delay as in how many how many hours do I wait for the data to arrive after which I will stop trying and looking for new data uh, and then there is a policy which says uh, should I try periodically to check for new data should I try you know once in uh, back off exponentially five minutes 10 minutes 15 minutes or not 15 minutes 10 minutes and it becomes uh, into two into two, two so on and so forth so should I back off how how often do you do a re uh, retry right how often do you look for the late data and you also see the retry policy there so we'll also say if this processing fails now uh, there's of course retry logic why would you want to retry this could be an intra failure a temporary glitch that might have caused the failure so in, in such cases you might want to retry a certain number of times so this is how your process definition uh, specification looks if you look at it most of uh, all the logic for late data or retry or even the consumption is all declarative there's no programming that you did there's no scripting that you did you just give it declaratively and Falcon understands this and goes ahead and acts on it so once you give a process this is what Falcon actually does so you've given your cluster definition you then give your process definition Falcon will actually create a workflow process for you in fact we do that so you give a pig let's say right so then we actually wrap it around the workflow to make sure it the chain is followed submit that workflow to Uzi right or in case of Hive we go to Hive and then uh, uh, we and once that is finished we have this messaging system which kind of acts back to Falcon and Falcon knows whether it is finished or not and for every scheduling Falcon also maintains its own state and graph so every time something is triggered we know what is happening with every execution of your process so that is how it goes so Uzi scheduler goes to Uzi then the processing happens we get an act back data is written onto HDFS and so forth now moving on to data management so yeah um, we talked about retention right so two reasons you might want to get rid of data one 
uh, you don't want to keep temporary data around for a long time. It just takes up space. It does not need to keep it around. Two, licensing requirements. Where we have seen that your license expires, let's say, end of year. By then, you have to get rid of all the data that you've been licensed for for this year. So these two conditions, you might want to get rid of data. Or you might even want to archive. So some of this summarized data, you don't look at it immediately. Maybe, I mean, you've looked at it now. But if you want to make it available one year later just for history's sake, you can archive it too. We have uh, archival to S3, and you can pretty much write a plugin which will archive to any place. Um, again, retention policy, like I said, is dictated by the kind of data. If, you, if it's a licensing requirement, uh, it's different. If it's just a temp data, I might want to get rid of it immediately after processing and things like that. So this is provided as a service. You'll see in the feed specification how you don't need to worry about when to trigger, write a cron job, how to move the data, how to delete the data, should I archive the data, and stuff like that. Um, data replication as a service. Uh, why would you want replication? One, disaster recovery, right? You want, to, you want to copy over the data from one cluster to another for disaster recovery. Second, local global aggregation. This is the use case that we actually have it in Mobi, where we say, I talked about the summarization of data. I summarize data in each, in each individual cluster and then send the summarized data to one global place where it does a Uber summarization. So that is the kind of uh, uh, use case we have for replication. So summary generated in every cluster gets replicated over to the Uber cluster or the global cluster. Um, and also, uh, when we do replication, this is like a, you know, a background job, which is outside your main processing. So you might want to limit the resources that you give for replication. You don't want this to be high priority. You might say, this is the uh, network I.O. that I want to use. You can go into that level and say, this is the net network resource consumption that I want to limit it to. Uh, and uh, uh, this is the job, uh, this is the priority with which I want this to run and things like that. So you can configure all that uh, with the data replication. Okay. So this is how your feed looks like. So again, um, you will say, what is the frequency of data arrival here? Uh, we'll go to SLM monitoring a little later. And then here is where you say, if you look at that retention, you'll say a uh, limit is two days, which means I need only last two days data. The rest go ahead and delete. So at any point in time, you'll see only last two days worth of data in your uh, uh, HDFS. And then there is replication. So if you see the two clusters, where I say there is a primary cluster and there's a secondary cluster. I'm saying copy data over as and when it arrives from the primary to the secondary cluster. And the same kind of retention is also set on the secondary cluster, where it says, OK, I also just need to delete it. Sometimes it might so happen that the secondary cluster might want to keep it for longer, because it's anyway, you know, it's a copy over, or you've archived the data. But the retention policy may be different for the secondary one. So, but it, so it lets you configure uh, retention there also. And this is where you specify the location. This is where my data resides. So if you see, this is all, uh, uh, it uses what we call the uh, regular expression where it says slash data, blah, blah, blah. And then you have a pattern which you can specify to say well, what kind of, uh, uh, how frequently the data arrives, what is the partition, year is a partition, month is a partition, day, hour, so on and so forth. So this is how a feed looks. Once you've done this, uh, the, the replication and deletion and all happens in the background. You won't even be looking at it. It'll keep happening. So yeah, feed scheduling pretty much follows a similar process as process scheduling. Only difference would be even these processes, like the retention and replication, run as workflows. Because I shouldn't be, um, I shouldn't be uh, you know, uh, trying to replicate already deleted data. So the retention has to follow first, and then the replication. So there's a small chain there also. And if you put in import and export, the chain becomes longer. So what we do is we, again, build a workflow for each of this, and then schedule it off on OZ. And the retention and replication workflow behaves like any other process, but to a user, It'll, you won't even look at it as a process, you'll look at it as a feed. I mean, you just say know whether the data resides or not till what time the data is available. This all, all happens you know, internally without you having to worry about it. Um, data governance, uh, Pragya is going to be talking about that. So data governance, what do we mean by data governance? Data governance deals with the usability, availability, and integrity of data in any enterprise. What to the capabilities Starkin exposes? It uses dependency graphs. It uses lineage for data flow, data that is current, as well as data that is previous, historical data. And then we have uh, SLA services for data monitoring. I'll be talking about them. Dependency graph. Uh, dependency graph shows the relationship that exists between various elements in a pipeline. By pipeline, I mean, as Pallavi explained, there's a flow of processes that happens in InMovie. 
So all the process and the feed and all the elements comprise of pipeline. Uh, the pipeline can contain entity and instance. And so we have the dependency both for entity and instance. Here comes the question what entity is, one, what instance is. Entity can be a process or feed or cluster. Feed and process are the thing on which mainly the processing happens. So they become the, uh, when we schedule the feed or process, then instances are spawned across it. That is, every run of an entity will give you an instance. With respect to process, it is one run of a of an entity, while with respect to a feed, it will be a one data window of the process, of the feed. For an example, say you have a process whose frequency is 5 minutes and it is consuming a feed which is minutely feed. So when you schedule it, the instance will be spawned every 5 minutes which will be consuming uh, feed data of one minutely data. So there will be 5 instances of feed which one instance of process will be consuming. Uh, then um, entity dependency. Uh, uh, for user to understand, till now we talked what XMLs look like, but if user wants to get a graphical notation of how the dependency work out, it gives us this. It gives the uh, relationship that exists between various elements like uh, processes, feeds and the relationship between them. So the APIs we have exposed usually give a JSON format uh, in the return, but that's not very user friendly. So what we have done is we have converted this JSON format into a dot notation which can be easily int interpreted in form of a graph. The graph looks something like this. So say I have in my pipeline, I have a click process which is producing a click feed. Click feed is nothing but a data path. Similarly, I have an impression process which is producing the impression feed. Click and impression are what Pallavi talked about. These are related to the data logs that we have. Now say I have another process which depends on these data. So this process, uh, this click and this process will consume the click feed and the impression feed and which will further be producing the unleashed feed, which is the output of this process. This output will then be consumed by the another process lying in the pipeline. So looking at the graph itself, user can say, oh, this is what is happening in my pipeline and I need not worry about it. When you schedule this entity, there will be instances spawned across this. User would want to like uh, to sh see the instance dependency graph also. So that's where the instance dependency comes into picture. Uh, it gives the information about what are the producer and consumer is with respect to each and every instance corresponding to an entity which is scheduled. Instance dependency graph looks something like this. Say here I have taken the second hourly instance of uh, the pipeline. Uh, I have a billing process of second, uh, second hourly instance of billing process which is consuming a click feed of second hourly and then this click and this process which is further consuming click feed and impression feed of the corresponding instances. And then they will produce a billing process will produce billing feed of second instance. That is nothing but a data path. As Pallavi shown like uh, in the path you can say uh, early, minutely and all those partitioning. This is where the partitioning come into picture. So second early I am saying so the data will go and decide on the second hour of the data path that you have given. Then uh, this path can further be consumed by the summary and output can be generated. Looking, looking at this, you can know what is happening to, uh, you can get the information related to instance level. So all the instances can thus be tracked using this. Uh, better picture can be given by a lineage. What is lineage? Lineage is the logical flow movement of data from source to destination. So in our pipelines, uh, we have say input feeds or input processes and the output processes. We want to see what is happening to the pipeline. We can lineage through it, walk through it, and see what information are, can be obtained. So it gives us the ability to filter out data on certain attributes of the entity. When I say filtering out data, I mean to say, like you have a graph with multiple nodes. Uh, you want to see, uh, give me all the entities that reside in this cluster, C1. So it will give you that information. Or you want to see, give me all the entities, say, which reside in cluster C1 but belong to user 1 or which run on the second hour of this instance. So it, it, you can have multiple conditions and you can obtain the results henceforth. Uh, as I said, uh, there are many relationships that exist between the, hello? Uh, there exists relationship between the, hello? Um, so there exists relationship between various entities and instances. These relationships are captured in the form of metadata tags and uh, we show them in the graph. I'll be showing the graph. And uh, Falcon adds this uh, capability for instances and um, 
and it is both and this is implemented using GraphDB. GraphDB is nothing but a DAG notation which uh, sh uh, any operation that you are performing, any CURD operation, by CURD I means you are creating any entity, you are creating any instance, you are reading it, you are updating it, you are performing any deletion on this, all those operations would be uh, stored in the graph itself uh, via uh, edges and vertices, where edges would be your entities, say processes, trees, clusters, and um, vertices with, with the relationship that exists between them. There can be multiple relationships like uh, who is the input of who, who is the user of who, who is the group, where is it storing, and all those relationships can exist. This would be specified by the tag. Then we have multiple APIs exposed to analyze matrix. Matrix example could be pipeline helpers. Say, I want to debug my pipeline. My pro pipeline failed at some point, and I don't know what went wrong. If I want to do that, what I can do is, since I have the entire flow with me, I can leverage a linear through the pipeline and see, okay, this is where the data got corrupted, and uh, looking at the root cause of the data, instead of uh, checking each and every process, I can go to the root cause, fix it, and then my pipeline will run fine. Fixing it can be via late handling or any such logic I have applied in my process of removal. Uh, so another um, example could be compliance failure. Since in Mobi is an ad serving company, we have m many compliances we want to adhere to. And, but uh, some process, uh, compliance could be like uh, we have user information, but there are some user information that uh, government has said that you can't use for further reporting and all. So, but some process anyhow use this uh, compliance, uh, didn't adhere to it and um, processing happened, but uh, later on we checked, okay, this went wrong. What, how do you check it? Again, you linear through the entire graph, and you see, okay, this is the point where it went wrong, this is where the data got corrupted, or we didn't adhere to the uh, rules and regulation we should have, and we correct it, and then the processing goes smooth. This is how an uh, entity graph would look like. So in this, I have a, um, the uh, vertices are processes, clusters, trees, and the uh, uh, edges are the relationship that exists between them. So I have a process P1, which whose input are two feeds F1 and F2, which reside on the cluster C1. Also, process is processed on the cluster C1 itself, and it gives an output feed F3, which resides on cluster C2. As uh, we know, feed is what uh, basically a data path, so it needs to reside on some cluster. Then there are the information like. Uh, uh, who owns the feed F1, who is owning the entity. That is relationship is also existing and uh, whether the entity itself is uh, uh, secure or not. Is it a secure server or non-secure server? All those information can be tracked via entity graph. When you schedule it again, instances will be spawned and you can see the uh, instance graph. So uh, in the, as from the previous example, when I schedule my process, instances will be spawned. So in here, I have an instance queue of process C1, which will consume feeds and input feeds instances. So um, say it is consuming two instances of feed one and one instance of feed two. Uh, the number of instances it consumes, again, depends on the frequency of the process and the feed. As I explained, uh, if process has, say, five minutely frequency and feed has minutely, then five instances it will consume and so forth. And then, then I'm saying that it runs on cluster C1, all the processing is happening on cluster C1, and all the tasks like oh, what is the instance of what, where it is stored, where all the processing is happening, is, uh, can be leveraged via the edges of it, which is the relationship between them. Now, querying on this graph, you can attain any type of information you want. You can get a subgraph of it, uh, depending on the query you may choose. How to query? Uh, Falcon exposes REST APIs. We also have CLI or we have dashboard. All these features can be queried via uh, these. SLA monitoring. What is monitoring? Uh, as data grows on, we need to monitor, like whether uh, the pipeline is functioning in the time limit it is supposed to function. And if it is not uh, adhering to the time limit it should, then if uh, the alert should be generated that it went beyond the time limit. That is where the monitoring comes into picture. Monitoring can be both for feeds and processes. For feed, it depends on the data availability. Whether the data came into the time it, you, it, has, it was supposed to come into the time, whether it was produced or not, whether it was consumed or not. With respect to process, it uh, depends on the triggering of the instance of the process. So whether the process got triggered at the time it was supposed to, whether it got spawned, whether it was waiting on some uh, data that didn't arrive. All these kind of uh, uh, 
uh, alerts can be triggered using SLA monitoring. Now, there are two types of SLAs that would be SLA low and SLA high. SLA low deals with the lower time limits in which the data uh, should have come from, should, have, should be there for the process to consume it. And the SLA high would be the higher time limit where uh, the maximum limit for which the process will wait for the data to be there for to be consumed by the pipeline. Uh, better example would be consider zoning system. So uh, till SLA low from the time the uh, instance spawn is the green zone where the, if the data comes no issues it will be consumed by the pipeline. If uh, we cross the green zone then uh, it's a serious issue and SLA monitoring will now uh, pull to the path and see whether the data is coming in or not. So SLA low to SLA high can be considered as the orange zone on which we keep continuously keep on following whether data is coming or not. And uh, uh, if at that time data comes, it will be consumed. Beyond SLA high is the red zone where we will say, okay, now whether the data comes or not, we are not consuming it and we go forward. SLA monitoring can also be tracked via dashboards that we have or we have pluggable alerting system. You can have emails uh, notifying you like whenever an SLA is missed, uh, it will notify you. Or we have JNS notification services. If any service wants to listen to it, they can plug into it and listen to the services and go forward. So this is a simple example. We, uh, I have a feed SLA which I'm scheduling and the frequency of the feed is minutely. And say some process is consuming this. It will, uh, uh, as you see the SLA low is three minutes and the SLA high is five minutes. So if the process is say five minutely, then uh, it will wait for the minimum time of three minutes for the data to occur. If data occurs, it will consume it and run fine. It, uh, but if uh, data still didn't uh, uh, come within the three minutes, then an SLA low will be triggered and we'll know, okay, data didn't come, but it's still we are in the green zone. Then we enter the orange zone and then we wait. Then monitoring service start and it starts polling whether the data is coming or not. If it still doesn't come within the time span of low and high, that is the two minutes over here, then uh, and uh, then uh, SLA high will be triggered and we'll say, okay, now uh, SLA high alerting is, will be there and then we can further go on. Uh, after that, even if the data comes, no issues. Uh, a CLI example would look like this. I, uh, I have, I will say, give me all the Falcon entities which are of type feed, uh, give me the SLA alert for them from and which started from the time, the time I have given. So this is, a, as you see, this is like very intuitive to the user. User can understand it. Okay, I want all the entities which are of type feed. Uh, whose start time is this and uh, generate the alerts if they have missed any alerts. So in the given cluster, it will give me all the uh, instances of the feed because I said feed type I want. So it will give with respect to the feed. It will give me all the instances where they reside, what is the time at which the SLA was missed, whether it was a SLA low or SLA high. Such information can be obtained with respect to a feed. Similar can go for a process. Uh, Now case study, the example that we are looking for uh, uh, is the distributing processing that we perform at InMobi. It goes something like it, uh, Hadoop usage at InMobi is approximately, we have approximately six cluster over there with one terabyte of storage at every cluster. There are approximately five terabyte of new raw data ingested every day and 20 terabyte of processing happens every day. We have 200 Hadoop nodes in every cluster and we, as we also leverage edge space there, that accounts to 40 nodes. We have 175K Hadoop jobs running daily on the cluster, 60K OZ workflows running daily. With respect to Falcom, we have 300 plus feed definition and correspondingly 100 plus process definition as well. And this is how a simple example would look like uh, in mobile. So click would be sent back to the server, there would be beacons listening to, beacons would be sent back to the server and the same would be stored in the logs. They can also be down, download for the ads uh, and then conversion events are generated corresponding to it. So many beacons have, keep on happening and uh, we store the further data into the logs. This huge amount of data, raw data, is then pushed onto the Hadoop cluster mi minutely every day. And, the, and then we do something like uh, we schedule processes of ours and uh, like the enrichment might happen, you want to uh, merge the various type of logs and extract meaningful information from them. And then finally, a summary is performed, which gives you a, like this, these are my dimensions and these are my measures. 
like uh, this is the meaning information that I want with respect to the raw data that I actually had. This is what is happening in one of the data units. In Mobi has five to six such data units and uh, parallel processing happens on all the data units. Uh, this happens, all the data units act as a local colo with a specific zone. With local colo, I mean to say, say uh, the colo that is responsible for a uh, specified reason for its uh, data processing. Like if uh, an ad request is coming from India, it will be processed in a colo, say, uh, Hong Kong, because that is the closest to it and fast retrieval of data, fast processing could be done and fast um, inference can be made from it. Similarly, if a request is coming from, uh, ad request is coming from US, it would be processed in a colo located in East Coast region. That's how it happened. Initially, what we used to do was uh, we could, uh, we would pass the data entirely to a uh, global center where the entire processing could have happened. But that would require a huge lot of bandwidth. The entire data has to be transferred from the local colo to the global colo. And also the processing on such a huge amount of data was tedious. So uh, uh, to overcome this challenge, what we did was we did the processing on each of the local colos. And the final summary that we obtained after the processing was, a, uh, was very small compared to the raw data that was coming into the picture. Since this uh, small uh, summary, and then we used to copy this small summary onto the global colos where the further aggregation would happen and then we can generate reports. Uh, since the summary was small, we could be saved on the bandwidth as well and the processing as well. Uh, this is how it would look like. The similar processing happening on all the data centers and uh, summary being copied. Where did Falcon come into picture? Instead of user ke keeping an account of the data processing and the transfer of data, all this stuff, Falcon, uh, we just need to schedule, uh, we just need to define a process. Uh, and in the process, I can say, these are the clusters where I want to run it. And this is the input feed, these are the output feeds we want for it. And then we need to submit the job on a Prism. And Prism, will, uh, Prism has servers attached to it. Those servers will keep that, okay, the proce this processing has to happen there, this processing has to happen in this column, and this processing has to happen in this column. So you know, Prism delegates all the services to servers where all the processing happens. Also, there are feed replications. Feed, you know, we are scheduling the feed, so replication would take uh, control of replicating the data from the local colors to the global colors. And there are retention services happening in the background, which keeps a track of, okay, um, this data is not uh, now important for me. Uh, delete it or archive it as per the defined in the feed. Then, um, uh, so um, user now need not do anything. We just need to schedule the process and Falcon takes care of all the retention, all the processing, all the duplication. And finally, the data comes on to the global cluster where further uh, processing can be done to um, inperform it. For human intervention or for machine intervention, reports can be generated. Further on. Pretty much done with uh, the capabilities of what Falcon has and how we use it at Inmobi. Any questions at this point in time? Yes, yes. It does not understand the dependencies. 
It does not understand that once this job is done and the data is available somewhere, something else needs to be done. Right? And it doesn't understand. Once the job is done, it consumes something, produces something, it is done. Right? As for produces something, it is done. It doesn't reply and all that. I totally understand. <laughs> that the you uh, recovery mechanism that takes it. But across these jobs, it does not understand the dependencies. Right? So when it say when I say the data is arrived here, the next one should pick up from there, it doesn't understand that. The timing is something that it doesn't understand. The dependency is something it doesn't understand. Again, when um, the recovery part, how do we retry? Why do we need to retry? Like I said, we need to take, when we retry, we need to take care of the whole dependency. It's not a single job that is retry. I have a data dependency here. I can't just retry the downstream job and not, you know, if something quit upstream, I need to, it needs to travel or percolate you know, throughout the chain. That's how it doesn't understand. So that is why this, you know, abstraction layer has come on top of it. The requirement is there to create this abstraction layer on top of it. Infrastructure taken care of here. Uh, 
um, Python pretty much sits much, much higher, high above the infrastructure. Like if you want these clusters, right, these clusters can be your private cluster like we have. We have our own data set. Or it can be AWS, right? Or your cloud can pretty much be wherever it wants to be and however secure it wants to be. So Python just makes sure, you know, it uses the right secure credentials to talk to it. Um, the security is one thing I just wanted to cover briefly, but yeah. Uh, my last question. Uh, so, it, uh, from what I understood, it does handle you know lot of real time data. But how fast is the processing? I mean, uh, what's the strength of that? Um, uh, okay, it's not actually real time data. Okay. Uh, um, in fact, Python is mostly into batch. So, our real time is much better. Very bad. So, uh, we are moving to a place. Python at least moving to a place where we want to integrate streaming also, where you say, "Look, my streaming source, and we should be able to uh, handle that also apart from this batch job." Right now, it's just this bad job, so we move on to streaming too. So it's not real time. Okay. <coughs> thank you. Thank you so much.
triggers only when the data arrives in its completeness. So there's a flag that you can set, for example, you can put underscore success file or something else over there which says, okay, now the data is complete, so we use that. Um, I had a few more slides, but uh, since we've run out of time, any last questions? Right, so um, we, the, okay, so there was one slide that I had for, I'm gonna skip all this. So the ones that come closest to Falcon are something called Goblin by LinkedIn and Nifi. Uh, but most of these kind of uh, uh, are very uh, focused on the ingestion part of it, not on the processing part of it. That's where Falcon is a distribution. And uh, which one did you say, sorry? Uh, Elastic Data Pipeline, well, uh, it's again like Uzi. That compares more like Uzi. It doesn't have the, I, I believe it doesn't have too much of data management capabilities. Yeah, exactly. So the process orchestration is there. Okay. So yeah, right. Like uh, I've, I've, I know that it does a processing orchestration, but the data management and the governance part is where it was lacking is what I understand. Um, okay. So uh, there are a lot of things that we are still working on. It's happening and all that. Uh, but this is my main slide. So if you want to learn more, there are links there. And most importantly, this is open source. If you want to contribute, contributors are more than welcome. Okay. So thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Pallavi and Pragya, for this great talk. I'd like to call Kirtana Srinivasan, the chair for the Made in India track, to present our speakers with the mementos. Can you give them a round of applause?